as I understand it, this is a, a fairly casual, um, informal workshop where we're thinking about sharing the gospel with Muslims. Uh, so let me say, in my mind, that means three things. Number one, this is not an exhaustive talk about Islam or about Christianity or things of that sort. So I'm pretty sure I won't address everything that you would hope that I would address. But number two, what I assume this means is we're gonna have a lot of question and answer, if that's okay. So rather than me sort of talk for an hour, uh, I'd much rather sort of hear what you're thinking, hear your questions, answer what I can, if I can, uh, but we share together in that way. Is that all right? Hmm. <laughs> Number three, this means you have to talk back to me. Uh, <laughs> all right, excellent, excellent. Well, let, let, me start, uh, let me start with just a few words about my own story. Uh, not because that's uh, particularly important, but at least give you a sense of how I, come to this, how I come to this subject. And part of why I want to tell my own story um, is because I do think that when, when the West encounters Islam, uh, we, we do have a lot of baggage that we bring to conversations with our Muslim friends and Muslim neighbors. Uh, particularly, or I don't know if it's particularly, but it's certainly true in the United States, if I was speaking to an audience like this in the United States, um, there would be people in the room who have pretty significant fears when it comes to engaging with Muslims. There will be people in the room for whom the main image in their mind is 9-11 and the towers coming down or some other kind of terrorist thing. Uh, there would be people in the room who would feel, uh, feel pretty ill-equipped. They, they wouldn't feel able to talk with Muslims about the gospel because of those fears and uh, because of their own doubts about their own knowledge of Christianity. Um, and so I, I find it's helpful in a room like this to sort of just say, yeah, let's, let's sort of lift those things up, and if we can, let's put them aside, right? Because in point of fact, uh, the, most of the Muslims whom you will meet, whether here in uh, Germany, in your neighborhoods, or in the workplace, or most of the Muslims that you might meet if you went to uh, a predominantly Muslim area of the world, um, not most of them, all of them are exactly like you in this sense. They're all people made in the image of God. They're all people who have been created to reflect the glory and the purposes of God. And they're like us in, in a lot of other ways too. They, they tend to want the same things. They tend to want to do well in life. Uh, they tend to want their children to go to good schools or have good opportunities and good advantages. Um, they, they tend to have very similar goals in terms of work and career and, and all those kinds of things. So what I want to encourage us is to have a neighborly understanding of, of our Muslim friends and people who are around us, rather than a, a political or fearful understanding. I was not born in a Muslim family. I was born in a nominally Christian family. I, like a lot of people in the southeastern United States, my family was a family that went to church occasionally, uh, went during Christmas and Easter and other times of that sort. If you'd ask my family, just like if you would ask almost anybody where I was born what religion they were, um, then to a person they would say they were Christians. Uh, largely that's because it's, it's the southern United States, which is, has the nickname of, its nickname in the southern United States is the Bible Belt. Um, so it's this big sort of part of the country where everybody is, at least in name, a, a kind of Christian. It's a kind of social, cultural Christianity. And I was certainly brought up in that, which means that I didn't have a, a, a thorough understanding of the gospel I didn't understand who Christ was and what Christ had come into the world to do, even though I was assuming myself to be a Christian. I didn't know much about the church or the place of the church, even though occasionally I would attend the church. So I was growing up with this very shallow understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And when I was um, about 15 years old, I had about two more years left of high school before graduating, uh, I was a pretty good student, an A-B student, uh, I was uh, a, a very good basketball player, uh, but that was about 50 pounds ago. Uh, <laughs> very good basketball player. And, and I had all of the, uh, my teammates and I, we had all of the sort of worldly 
popularity that comes from being, you know, a pretty good sports team in a small town in the United States, right? And, and what I did with that was I used it to satisfy my sin nature, right? So all the advantages that, that I got from that particular status, uh, I used to satisfy my sin nature. Well, after my, my sophomore year in high school, two years left uh, in high school, uh, along with a number of other guys, I got arrested. It was the first time I'd been in trouble. I'm the youngest of eight kids. I have um, older brothers. I have four older brothers. And the only thing that I, I really kind of understood about the church was that when my older brothers got in trouble with the law, which happened fairly regularly, uh, they had this routine. They'd get in trouble. They would swear they weren't going to get in trouble anymore. And as proof, they'd go to church for a while. You know, so church was a little bit like rehab. You know, it's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of where you went when the trouble was really bad. And uh, I had never been in trouble before. And so I'm thinking to myself, I'm in trouble. I don't like this. I've broken my mother's heart, my mother's heart. I'd better go to church. And so I went to church for several months, and uh, it was not a church where the gospel was clearly preached. There were lovely people in this church, dear family friends in this church, uh, people who did a lot of good in the community. Um, the pastor was, a, in so many ways, a wonderful man, but it was not a clear gospel-preaching church. And so he did what a lot of churches did in our community. He, at the end of the service, did an altar call where he invited people to come up front and to become members of the church and to be baptized. And I, I had no idea what was going on, but I figured I've been going to church for two months, and this is about the time where my brothers would now go back to what they were doing and be in trouble again, and I don't want to do that, so I'm going to do this next thing that's happening. I'm going to go up front. So I go up front. And a few minutes later, after one of the deacons takes me in this back room and talks to me and gets my, my address information, he comes back out front and he announces to the congregation that I was a candidate for baptism. And I just thought, wait, hey, that, you didn't say anything about that. And um, so two weeks later, I'm, I'm dunked in the water. And, and but it's sort of like joining a gang. You've got to get jumped into the gang. You know? So I get dunked in the water and, and I'm brought out. I dry off and I leave the church and I go right to the pool hall where I spent all my time. I was not converted. was not saved. Didn't understand the gospel. Now, this experience early on had, had a significant impact on me. It left me believing that Christianity was false, that it was pie in the sky, that it was make-believe, that it was great for little blue-haired ladies, but it had no, it had no power in it. That's, that was kind of my thinking when I go off to university. Uh, I should say one other thing, just biographically. My father left when I was about 14. He left the family when I was about 14 years old. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was, I was really angry about that. And um, I had a, a teacher in high school who tried to help me with my anger. Uh, she was this little eccentric lady from New York. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Nanny McPhee? Does that ring any bell for anybody? So a couple of hands. She looked like Nanny McPhee at the beginning of the movie. Uh, you know, just sort of wild hair and just this just, just wonderful little lady. And she gave me, um, she saw my anger and she was trying to help me with my anger. And she gave me a collection of writings from leaders from the United States in the 1960s. Uh, these were radical leftist leaders. Um, and so basically reading those, reading those guys, I got more angry. Uh, and so I went, off, I went off to university, this angry young man, 18 years old. My face was just always in a scowl. I, I didn't even know that I was scowling. It's just how my face had fixed itself. Um, my wife and I could be walking across campus and, and we could be walking through the middle of a crowd and the crowd would just kind of part around us because it's like, who's this angry kid, you know? Um, that's, how I, that's how I was. I was angry that my dad had left. I thought Christianity was false. And my first year at university, uh, I see these men on campus. They're very clean cut, very upright. They're coming from the community to the campus at various student events. Um, and whenever there was a lecturer on campus or something of that sort, they were sure to participate. And they, and they were often talking about the importance of, of men being men, of being self-controlled, righteous, living clean lives free of alcohol and drugs and uh, being faithful to their wives and raising their families. Um, 
And, and as a little boy whose dad had left when he was 14, I'd never seen men like this. And, and it was just, it was like a bee to honey. I was just drawn to them. Long story short, uh, these men were all Muslim men, right? And so my freshman year began to study with these men. Uh, and to think about Islam and the claims of Islam. My second year in university is when I converted to Islam. Uh, I would have been a Sunni Muslim. Um, and uh, began to practice Islam and became very zealous for Islam. And, and throughout my years in university, uh, would lead a number of other men uh, into the faith, into the religion of Islam. I, I became a real zealous uh, defender of Islam and, and an opponent of the cross. So when, so when Christian students would have their events on campus and begin to talk about um, Jesus and the crucifixion and Christianity, I'd be that guy in the crowd arguing against that as false and, and not true. And I would be doing that in part on the strength of my previous experience. Um, and so became a real champion for Islam. Lived that way for several years until my wife and I, um, several things happened in, in our lives. One was literally a water cooler conversation. Now, not all water cooler conversations in the workplace are bad. Uh, and this was a very good one in my life. We're standing uh, literally at a water cooler. There are about five of us. And uh, one of my coworkers who I had gone to university with, she knew me from university, we were all talking about world leaders whom we respected. So one person would say, you know, I respect Mahatma Gandhi and would talk about Gandhi and different things. Another person said, I, I respect Martin Luther King Jr. and talked about Martin Luther King Jr. and all those good things. Well, Tracy, my friend from university, after about three or four people like that had been named, Tracy says, well, there's nobody I respect more than Thabiti. And I said, stop it, you know. She says, no, 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 I'm serious. And I said, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Tell me more. <laughs> and she says, uh, and she talks about why. She says, you don't, you don't, you don't drink alcohol. You don't mistreat Christy. You know, and she named all these things. And she says, you're the most righteous person I know. Now, what she didn't know was inside, I was aware of my anger and hatred. I was aware of my lust. I was aware of a whole lot of things that, that, that proved I was not righteous. And that if I wasn't righteous in my own conscience, in my own sight, all of a sudden, it was like I was struck by lightning. I was standing there and I realized that if I wasn't righteous in my own sight, how in the world was I going to be righteous before God who knew these things about me? That was the first thing this awakening to the idea that I needed a righteousness that would please God. And, and as a faithful Muslim, I didn't have it. Here's the second thing. My wife and I were um, expecting our first child. We were pregnant with our first child. And uh, we were, we're both from big families. I'm the youngest child of eight kids. She's number seven. She's the youngest girl of eight kids. And so it was like the babies of the families were about to start having babies. And so our, our families would come down to our apartment and, and it'd be like a whole caravan of people just, you know, driving up to the, and they'd be bringing bucket loads of food and drinks. And, and it was just a party every weekend. We were just having this wonderful time. This, this great celebration was going on. And three months into the pregnancy, when we would hear the baby's heartbeat for the first time, I'm in the doctor's room. I, we're waiting on the doctor, and I'm out in the lobby. I, I can't sit still. I'm, I'm pacing in the lobby. I'm just so excited, and, and uh, she's excited. And we go back into the room, and, and, and doctor puts her on the table and, and puts that jelly stuff on her tummy and begins to look for the baby's heartbeat. We're all excited, and, and a minute goes by, and three minutes go by, and, and five minutes go by. And the doctor says, in the coldest human voice I have ever heard in my life. There's no heartbeat. And standing there in that room, all of our, our idolatry, because we were beginning to worship the idea of starting a family and, and, and pursuing the American dream, you know, the White House and the picket fence and the two and a half kids, all of that just came crashing down. And, and, and we felt 
for the first time a sense of our smallness in the universe, that the things that we, the things that we held most dear and the things that we, were, had, were in fact, were living for, we, we couldn't protect, we couldn't keep. And so that put me in a bit of a, of a depression. Um, I should have been at work, and I was at home in my pajamas watching television. I was just talking to a young man a moment ago. I turned to BET to watch some rap videos and uh, sitting there, and um, this little preacher comes on television, guy probably about that tall, balding, very plain-looking man, little suit, walks up to the pulpit, and uh, he opens the Bible, and he's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he begins to explain 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse by verse. I'd never seen preaching like that. And, and, and even though in my heart I had really been an opponent of the gospel, I, I couldn't explain the attraction I now had to listening to this preacher. I'm sitting there listening to this preacher, and it's like someone has rewritten the Bible. It was like, oh, now the Bible, the Bible was making sense. It, it, had, it had truth, it had power, it had beauty to it. And so I started watching the show, and my wife would come home. I, I taped the show. I said, man, you got to watch the show I watched today. She said, what is that? I said, well, it's this preacher on television. And she would look at me like I had three heads, you know, because, because she remembered how I used to treat preaching and how I used to treat preachers. And we began to watch a show. And long story short, about six months later, we found out his church is in the Washington, D.C. area. Her sister lives there, so we visit her sister one weekend so that we can go to this church, and we're in a church service of about 8,000 people. We're sitting about 10 rows from the pulpit, right in front of the pulpit, and he is preaching Exodus 32, which is the famous passage where the children of Israel make the golden calf, right? And he's preaching that passage, and he's preaching about idolatry and about sin, and it's like I'm the only person in that church of 8,000 people. It's like he's talking directly to me. And then he began to preach Christ from that passage. Crucified for our idolatry, the one true God, the Son of God. Raised for our justification. And as he began to preach Christ, some things that never made sense to me as a Muslim all of a sudden fell into place. I never understood how God was going to be completely holy as I believed as a Muslim. And yet also off merciful, often merciful, as I believe. How is he going to be holy and punish me for my unrighteousness and at the same time forgive those unrighteousness, that, that unrighteousness? How is he going to be gracious and just? You know, those are things that I couldn't hold together. And I couldn't hold together the idea that Jesus was born of a virgin, which is plainly taught in the Quran, and yet was not the Son of God, which every Muslim denies. How is Christ born of a virgin, and why is that important? And why does the Hadith say that Satan touches everyone in the womb except Christ? Why, why must he be pure? Well, I didn't have an answer for that as a Muslim, but here in the preaching of the gospel, I was, I was being told that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that he had to be perfect and without blemish so that he could provide our righteousness, and that he was taking our place in both judgment and righteousness. And so lots of things that had been questions for me were now sort of clicking. They were falling into place as this man preached the gospel. And in God's great kindness to us, that Sunday morning under the preaching of the gospel from Exodus 32, my wife and I both were converted to faith in Christ. And the Lord was kind, so kind, to give us new life together as husband and wife. Well, fast forward a number of years, and the Lord would uh, begin in 2006, uh, give me the privilege of going to uh, the United Arab Emirates um, and participating in uh, a series now, I think we've done five, uh, public Christian-Muslim dialogues. Uh, to my knowledge, this, this just does not happen very often in that part of the world. It certainly doesn't happen publicly. Um, and, and with the kind of freedom that the Lord has granted us through the authorities there uh, in the UAE. This past debate, which was last, last May, I believe it was, had the privilege of, of standing and sharing, engaging in conversation uh, with a fellow named Shabir Ali, who is a Muslim apologist out of Toronto, Canada, uh, thinking about this very question of how do we find forgiveness with a holy God? And so God has been very kind over the last 10 years of my life to give me privilege to preach the gospel uh, in parts of the world uh, where Christ is not known, where he's actively opposed, 
uh, to, to lovingly reach out to Muslim neighbors and friends uh, to try and help them understand um, the truth about Christianity and by God's grace come to faith in him. Uh, in, in that work uh, and in my own experience, there, there are about five things I want to hold out to you real quickly and then we'll do some, some question and answer. There are about five things I want to suggest to you um, that might be helpful in, in doing evangelism with your Muslim neighbors and friends. The first one is this. Use your Bible. Use your Bible. It's amazing how often in my own sort of life as an evangelist and a Christian, it's amazing how often I look to tell people about Jesus and never open the Bible, right? Uh, where where I, I sort of want to give them that message in a couple of sentences and, and hope that's kind of a magic bullet that, that hits the heart. In my experience, um, using a Bible in Muslim evangelism is, is very effective for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I spend my time, a lot of my time, talking to Muslims who want to be apologists for Islam. And part of what they're interested to do is to try and, and tear the Bible apart, to try and prove that it has contradictions and, and things of that sort, uh, which I know aren't there. I used to believe that as a Muslim as well. i never forget, uh, as we were moving to the Cayman Islands, um, 2006, we were driving through uh, North Carolina, and my wife and I both got this little flu bug. Uh, and so we went to this little clinic to, to get some medicine for our flu, and our nurse was a Jordanian man. Um, and I was reading a book called The Prophet and the Messiah, which I would recommend to you. It's by an Arab Christian named Chalkot Mukari, M -O, in English, M-O-U-C-A-R-R-Y. Great book. He comes in, he sees me reading the book, and he says, what are you reading? I said, well, Prophet and Messiah, I don't feel like talking because I'm kind of sick. My head is all congested. And he says to me what, what very often he says, oh, are you a student of comparative religion? If I had a dollar for every time I've been asked that question, I said, Something like that. And he goes on like a 30-minute spiel about American foreign policy in the Middle East, right? And, and I just listen, I just listen. Here's a tip. Never get caught up in discussions of foreign policy. That's just not your agenda, right? You want to get to Jesus. And so I'm sitting there, and, and he goes on and on and on. And then finally he asked me some question. I said, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. And he looks at me and he says, he says, now he's on his way out of the door. He puts his hand on the doorknob and this is like his final thing to me. He opens the door and he turns to me and he says, you know what? No Muslim would ever convert. You know, if, if, if they're Muslim, you know, it's so wonderful to be a Muslim. It would never become a Christian. You could never show to me a person who was a Muslim who has become a Christian. I said, okay, Lord. <laughs> I said, well, that's interesting. I said, I used to be a Muslim. And his jaw just, you know, hits the floor kind of thing. He said, really, why? He said, why did you become a Christian? And I gave him a short answer. I said, but if you really need, you want to know more, I'd love to sit down with you and talk about that. Now, we were just passing through town, so we changed our plans, stayed over a little bit longer, and he and I had like a five-hour lunch the next day. He came with a little white piece of paper that, that had all these things on it that were supposed to be contradictions in the Bible. And so that's where we started. We just opened the Bible. Now, here's the deal. Usually, if you read four verses before the verse that they are talking about, if you'll start four verses above that and read four verses beneath that, all the answers are right there in the text. All right? And so they, they, you have this wonderful situation where we're, we have home field advantage. We, we are standing on our book. We are defending our book by simply teaching it in context. And God does the evangelism. God makes the case through his own word. So the first thing I want to encourage you to do is, is believe the Bible, trust the Bible, and let the Bible do the work. You know, you don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes Christians feel nervous because they say, well, what if they ask me a question about something I don't understand? Well, that's okay. Here's what you say. I don't know the answer to that right now, but I'm sure there is an answer. Why don't we study that? You just turn it into a reason to continue studying the Bible, right? And, and two things happen. You grow as a Christian as you do that. And number two, your, your friend begins to understand the Bible more clearly, Okay. So the first thing I want to suggest to you is when you're sharing the gospel with Muslims, use your Bible. And here's another reason why that's important. They believe the Quran is 
the one miracle of Islam, that, that it is divine revelation from God. And they think that our Bible has been corrupted or twisted. So one of the things we have to do as apologists is demonstrate the truthfulness of the Bible. There are two ways of doing that. One is you can, you can make certain intellectual arguments for the Bible, and, and that's important. But I think the best way to do it is to show that in your own life and in your own evangelism, you trust the Bible as true. And the way to do that is just to open it, explain it, work through it, answer the questions that your friend is raising for you. All right? First thing, use your Bible. Here's the second thing. Defend the Trinity. Defend the Trinity. We were thinking about Ephesians chapter 1 earlier today. And as we saw in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, every person in the Trinity is involved in our salvation. This means that in our evangelism, if we abandon the Trinity or we abandon the deity of Christ, for example, we're going to be abandoning the gospel itself. Right. Here's, how, here's how Jesus defines uh, eternal life in John's gospel, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Really coming to be saved is in a very fundamental sense coming to accept God as he offers himself in the gospel. It's coming to believe that God is who he says he is in his triune person. And in believing in particular that it is the Son of God who reveals the, the, the glory of God, right? So Paul says in Colossians that in Christ the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. These are precious Christian truths. Now, you're going to have to do some things to clarify what we mean and what we don't mean by the Trinity. So we're going to have to clarify, A, that we do not mean that there are three gods, right? We, we are not polytheists. We believe in one God. And we believe he exists eternally in three persons, right? And so we're just going to have to defend that. We're just going to have to embrace that. And you'll get questions about whether or not that's logical and things of that sort. Uh, here's what I appeal to. I don't appeal to logic at that point. I appeal to the scriptures, which is why number one is so important. You see, one of the things that we have in common with our Muslim neighbors is that our Muslim neighbors are, are people of the book, too. They believe in revelation. They believe in the scriptures. And if they're being honest, they, they, they have to admit that it's their duty to submit to God's word. Well, that, that again gives us a great advantage because in the Quran, the prophet Muhammad affirms the books of Moses as scripture. He affirms the Psalms of David as scripture. And he affirms the Injil, the Gospels, as scripture. Now, your Muslim friend will want to have all kinds of debates about what that means, and, and he'll want to insist that they are corruptions in the Bible, but, but here's what we want to press home. If we are faithful believers in God, we have to submit to what he tells us about himself in his word, right? And so when it comes to the Trinity, we, we simply want to say, this is what's revealed of God. He's one God in three verses. From the earliest verses in the book of Moses in Genesis chapter 1, where God says something that's cryptic at that point. He says, let us make man in our image. We get a sense of the, the plurality of persons in the Godhead. That's not a plural of majesty, as Muslims would sometimes claim. For at that point, there is no monarchy in Israel. He's not using the language of a, of a kingly court at that point. No, he's using language. God is using language to reveal to us something about his person. And even earlier than that, in the first couple of verses in Genesis 1, we read there that the Spirit hovers over the deep. And it's the Spirit who's active there in the creation of the world. And then we come down to John chapter 1. And John, using the language of Genesis chapter 1, talks about this one who was in the beginning. And not only was he in the beginning, but he was with God. And not only was he with God, but he was God. And it tells us there about the deity of Christ. You see, in all of this, the Bible is teaching us about the nature of the Godhead. And we want to defend the Trinity because it's revealed in the Bible and we believe the Bible. And because each person in the Trinity is involved in the work of the gospel, is involved in the saving of sinners. It's, it's integral to us. It's not an aside. 
And the other thing that we have to do in defending the Trinity is we have to clarify Muslim misunderstanding. Because you may meet many Muslims, depending on what part of the world they're from, who think that we believe that the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and Mary. All right? It's a significant error. Shows that the writers of the Quran themselves did not understand the Christianity with which they were engaging. All right? No, it's God the Father, God the Son, and, Holy, and the Holy Spirit. And we do not believe, as some Muslims believe, that, 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 that God somehow had intimate relations with Mary and they had a son, Jesus. You know, that's in the back of the, of the Muslim mind, many Muslims. That's not what we have in view at all. So, so when they say something like that and they seem aghast at the idea, uh, we want to be horrified at the idea too because that's, that's not at all what we mean. But that there was a miraculous birth. As, as Jesus puts it in, in Hebrews, God prepared a body for his son. And Christ came into the world fully God and fully man in order to accomplish our salvation. So we want to defend the Trinity. Number three, uh, we, we want to be sure to make sin personal and not just theoretical. So our, our Muslim friend will have a vague notion of sin compared to the Christian notion of sin. In the Christian mind, sin is not only transgression against the commands of God, sin is more profound than that. Sin is also our nature. We sin because we are sinners, right? In our nature, we have this hostility toward God. We are turned away from God, uh, and that's what issues forth in particular acts of sin. There's a, there's a cosmic treason against God. And because of that treason in the nature of, of fallen mankind, we are accountable to God. We are liable to his judgment. We deserve his judgment. His wrath is right, and his wrath needs to be satisfied. And we all are not only inheritors of sin from Adam and Eve, our first parents, but we are, we are also progenitors of sin. We are creators of sin. We, we do willfully rebel against God in our fallen state. Now, the Muslim has a, a sort of different notion of sin. He, he thinks of sin a, a bit more lightly than that. Sin is a kind of fault. It's a kind of error. But it's not the kind of thing, as in the Christian view of God, where, where God's anger has to be satisfied. God can forgive sin just by forgiving sin. There's no atonement that's needed. There's no sacrifice that's needed. Uh, no man can stand in the place of another man and, and, and take their guilt. To the Muslim idea, this is, this is repugnant. This is... This this, this is wrong. This would be wrong of God. But again, what you want to do is get far more personal than that. You want to ask them particular questions about their own lives. A good thing to do is to use the law of God. Our Muslim neighbors love the law. A good thing to do would be to turn to uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and see there how Jesus handles the law, Right? So Jesus says things like this, you have heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you look on your neighbor's wife with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. And so you ask your Muslim friend the question, now have you ever looked lustfully on someone else? Here the prophet Jesus, they would consider him a prophet, he teaches that actually lust in your heart is sin against God. Or, or Jesus says, you have heard it said, um, basically, that you, you, you should not kill, you should not murder. And, and he says, but I say to you that if you have anger in your heart toward your brother, you've already committed murder. And to ask the question, have you ever been angry at someone else? Yeah. That's the root of murder. You know, and, that, and, the, and the turn to where Jesus says, these things come out of the heart. It's not what goes into you that defiles you. And that's really useful in Muslim evangelism because in so much of Muslim worship, the idea of cleanliness is, is prominent. This is why Muslims do ablution before their prayers, why they wash their hands, they go through the cer ceremonial washing. It's, it's a symbolic way of, of, of cleansing oneself before God. And you're going to say, well, how do you cleanse your heart? If, if Jesus says, and you respect Jesus as a prophet, that your heart is dirty, and that's where these other things come from. How will you be clean before God with a dirty heart? 
What you're trying to do there is to force them to think about their own sin and to think about it in the light of God's holiness and to, and to no, no longer think about it abstractly, but to say, you know what? One day I'm going to be before the throne of God, right? And I'm going to have to give an account for my sins, yeah? And you want to do that because until the bad news really is bad news, then the good news of the gospel uh, really isn't effective. So at this point, here's a tip. In my Muslim evangelism, I don't move past the doctrine of sin until the person is admitting that they're sinners, right? Because everything else then just becomes a kind of theological debate. And I'm not really interested in theological debate. I'm, I'm really interested in winning this person to Christ and seeing their soul saved. That's what they were made for, right? So assuming the person is, is willing to admit their own sin and to admit that they, give an, they must give an account to God and to admit that they have no righteousness before God that will, that will please God, that God's standard is perfection uh, in judgment, then we're ready to talk about the good news. And that's where we want to talk about the cross of Christ, right? So that would be our, our number four there, I think. We want to talk about the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And both of these things are things that the Muslim, uh, the Muslim really wants to oppose or reject as, as, as unsuitable and untrue historically. And, and here's where 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we realize this is, this is to use a, a meta, uh, I don't know how you would say this in, in Germany, uh, Matthias, but for us, we would say this is, the whole, this is the whole ball of wax. This is the whole shooting match. Um, Everything depends on this issue. Look, Matthias is looking at me like, I don't know how we'd say that in German either. <laughs> Everything is depending upon the cross of our Lord and the resurrection of our Lord. The argument of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is, if there is no resurrection, we are most foolish of all people. Our faith is futile. The pre our preaching is futile. We are still in our sins and we will not be raised. We may as well eat, drink, and be merry. But Christ is risen. He has been raised from the dead. He was crucified. And now, because of his resurrection, nothing else matters. Everything now is viewed in light of this, of, of this resurrection. It's the resurrection that gives everything else meaning for the Christian. And so we want to turn, number four, to talking about the crucifixion of our Lord. And there, we want to explain what's happening on the cross. That, that number one, Jesus is taking our place. And number two, and in taking our place, he's really receiving our penalty. The wrath of God is being poured out upon him. And number two, not only is he taking our place, but he is now an offering for us. He, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's been offered up for us as that sacrifice that atones for our sin, that, that covers over our sin and our guilt and our shame. So apart from that sacrifice, we have no sacrifice that pleases God. Now here's something I've, I've learned in the, in the years of, of dialogue in, in the UAE, is that it's helpful sometimes because the Muslim initially kicks against this idea of a substitute in our place. It's helpful to trace that idea through the Bible if you can. Very simple ways of doing this, right? So you go all the way back to the Exodus. And you talk about the Passover. And you talk about the, the blood of the lamb that was put on the doorposts in, 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 in the Exodus. So that when God saw the blood on the doorposts, he spared the firstborn child of those households. Right? Paul says that Christ is our Passover lamb. You know, it's a picture pointing forward to the sacrifice of Christ. Or you come down in Israel's history a little bit later, and you look at those passages where, where God puts in place the sacrificial system, where bulls and goats are to be, are to be slaughtered in worship and offered to God. Well, it's not because the blood of bulls and goats has any power uh, to cleanse us. And the writer of Hebrews explains, no, they're, they're, they're pictures that are pointing to the one perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Or here's one that's useful with your Muslim friend. Abraham and Isaac. Now, Muslims will understand that it's not Abraham and Isaac, but Abraham and who? Esau. Yeah? And so, and so they, would, they would understand. Did I get that? You like it? Ishmael. Thank you. This, she's such a wonderful help me. You know, she keeps me straight. Abraham and Ishmael. And so they would want to argue that, no, actually that's, that's you know, pointing to the Arab nations and, and so on and so forth. That's really not our argument. Our main point there is to say, 
But what was happening between Abraham and his son? God was calling him to sacrifice his son. And at the last minute, God prepared a substitute, a ram that was in the bush that was sacrificed instead of his son. What's the picture there? Well, the picture is of God supplying a perfect sacrifice who would take the place of us. And so one thing to do is just to show that that idea of substitution is right there in the Bible from the earliest parts of the Bible all the way up to its climax in Jesus Christ. And if we've done step number one very well of defending the Bible, then, then he has to treat that or she has to treat that as, as, as revelation from God. That that's precisely what God is in the world doing to save sinners. And then we have to defend not only the cross but also the resurrection that he rose three days later from the grave, and that, and that really he rose, Romans 4, 25, for our justification. And so we have to talk to, about the fact that what we have in the Gospels, in, 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 in contradiction to Muslim claims, what we have in the Gospels is eyewitness accounts. We have the records written by people who were there, who saw him crucified, who saw him buried, who went to the tomb three days later and discovered the tomb empty, and who saw him resurrected uh, in, in, in person, appearing to individuals and appearing to the apostles and disciples and appearing, 1 Corinthians 15, to as many people, as, as many as 500 people at one time. What we have is eyewitness accounts. The Quran and the prophet come 600 years later. So if the resurrection is false... It's really up to those who came 600 years later to give us some proof that it's false. And yet all of Christian history and all of the world history produces no proof in contradiction to the resurrection. One of the most remarkable things to me when I think about religious history and I think about the resurrection, one of the most remarkable things to me is that a Jewish community that was so opposed to Christ and so opposed to the truth that he taught, and so invested in his death, produced no evidence to contradict his resurrection. That Jewish history, world history, Christian history is either silent on the resurrection or affirms that Christ indeed was raised from the grave in the Gospels, and that this is what Christians have believed for all of time. So, so when they're pushing on you about the cross and the resurrection and, and trying to deny it, push back and say, you have, to, you have to produce more than just your word or Muhammad's word. You've got to produce some evidence because thus far, all of the evidence is on the side of the crucifixion and the resurrection. So one final thing. Uh, so we want to use our Bibles. We want to defend the Trinity. Uh, we want to get personal about sin. And then we want, to, we want to teach plainly what's happening on the cross and the reality of the resurrection. Uh, number five, and finally, uh, we want to push repentance and faith. We want to push the proper response to the gospel. That this is not just some intellectual news that we can hear and put on a shelf. This news makes a claim upon our lives. This news calls us to respond to it. And the response that the Bible gives is that we must turn from our sins and we must put our trust in Christ and we must follow him. We must take up our cross uh, and follow him. And, and it's helpful at this point to realize uh, that while most of us probably come from situations where to become a Christian at the worst, it's seen as kind of foolish. Why would you do that? At the best, many of us come from places where that's a respectable thing to be. Uh, well, many of our Muslim friends are coming from contexts that are much closer to the New Testament context, where to become a Christian is to break from family. It is to break from faith and religion, the old faith and religion. And it is to, it is to put yourself in a position of suffering for Jesus. And that metaphor of picking up your cross has a different kind of weight than, than, than maybe for us, for whom that's a respectable thing to do. Which means that when we call our Muslim friends to repent and to believe, we also must be prepared to become their family. We must be prepared to love them and to walk with them, uh, to welcome them perhaps into their home if they're going to be disowned by family. 
to figure out a way to help them to make ends meet and to earn a living if, if they're going to be cut off, say, from family business or some other business that might be owned by uh, a, a fellow Muslim or a Muslim community. It means that when we call them to repent and to believe, we're actually calling them to die and to newness of life. And part of that newness of life really must be the church. It really must be the people of God standing with them, helping them through these costs and these difficulties. And here's what we want to explain. That following Christ will be costly. It will cost them everything. But it's worth it. It will be eternally worth it. We need to know that in our own souls uh, so that we can call people to pay costs that perhaps we haven't paid. And so they might have the eternal reward that Christ offers. So those are five things. Let me stop rambling. That was longer than I meant for it to be. Uh, and let me just open it up, see if there are any questions, comments, or concerns. Okay. Yes, sir. When you point out Muslims to read the, to read the scriptures on their own, or it's your experience that they don't need. Because my context is, <laughs> I think a lot. Okay. Um, from your experience, uh, would you say that the Muslims do not read the scriptures? Because my experience is, I thought I, I won the battle by giving them out Bible in their language. And they come back to me and say, we don't read. And so I'm back to square one, I think, where I have to explain where I thought yeah. for them having the word of God, that will yeah. be kind of like a case one. That's a great question. Uh, I, this is why I think using your Bible when you're having conversations with them is so important. Uh, because the, the Bible is not like the Quran. Uh, in a couple of different ways. The Bible is a, is a narrative, right? There's a history, there's a, there's a timeline that's happening with the Bible and God is revealing himself through that timeline. Uh, the Quran is organized in ways that are not chronological. It's, it's not a lot of narrative. There's a lot of law and a lot of aphorisms and things of that sort. And, and in many Muslim societies, maybe most Muslim societies, there's great dependence on, on, the, uh, on the imam or the mullah. There's great dependence on the religious teacher such that most, most Muslims will maybe have learned some Quran, maybe have memorized it, memorized it in an Arabic that's really quite arcane and difficult. And so they don't read their Qurans and don't understand their Qurans. Um, and so coming now to to Christianity and coming to the Bible is really a different kind of religious experience. Um, so I think what I would say is where you have opportunity to read the Bible together, to explain it, to teach it in its context, that's better. Uh, sometimes what you're probably getting behind that comment is the belief that many Muslims have, which is just to own a Bible or to read a Bible means you have converted, right? Um, and so that there's, a, there's an opposition to it really on that level. So there may be people who in fact can read, um, but they're going to pay a cost for having a Bible or seeming to read the Bible. There's not that same kind of freedom um, in many Muslim families and many Muslim communities. Um, and so that you have to sort of figure out what you're getting there, what the response is there. Uh, if it's a problem with reading, then maybe reading together. If it's a problem with um, that that wrong view that just holding a Bible or having a Bible or reading the Bible means you have converted, then you might want to look for safer ways to, to read the Bible with them. Um, but there are many folks, who, many Muslims who have come to faith reading the Bible. Uh, and so I would encourage you to continue to give the Bible as a gift um, to, to as many people as you have opportunity to do that with. It's a great question. Yes. Uh, to follow on from that question and point one of use the Bible, an objection I've received a few times is the Bible is unreliable. Mm -hmm. It's all been translated so many times. It's been distorted so many times over 2,000 years. Yeah. And the, as you just said, the Quran is in its original archaic Arabic, quite hard to understand. I'm sure we would not get as much out of the Bible if we were still trying to read it in Hebrew and Greek. So how do we, uh, how do we even get to that first base of, no, our Bible is reliable? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think what I would do in order to sort of get that issue out of the way is to say, hey, can you be more specific? Can you produce any place where we have reason to believe that the Bible is not accurate, right? Uh, they're not going to be able to do that. And then what I would want to say is, okay, well, let me tell you why 
The Bible is accurate. And I would say something that, that the Muslim would, would probably resonate with. I'd say something like, God is all powerful and he's able to protect his word. That's the claim that Muslims use for the Quran. And then I would say, well, if God is all powerful and he's able to protect his word, why would he not pr protect what the Quran says is a revelation from him in the Bible? See, at that point, you're giving him difficulty with his own God, his own view of God, right? And of course, the answer is he is able to protect it, and he has, and he has protected it, right? Um, and I, I would want to just sort of work through that. And there are other things that you could do to, to sort of demonstrate the reliability of the Bible. And the other thing I would want to say is, and actually, we believe God is all wise. Of course, the Muslim does too. In fact, he is so wise that he's able to reveal his word in multiple languages, right? Even at the same time. So we turn to Acts chapter 2. And Pentecost and the apostles are preaching in Pentecost and the gift of tongues falls on the church and people hear God's word in their own language. And I would say, actually, we have a bigger view of God's power and God's wisdom than the view of Islam, which says he only speaks in Arabic. You know? um, and so that's how I would start with that. And I would, and I would just sort of say, hey, let, let's be intellectually honest. Unless you have proofs of the Bible's um, corruption, Let's put that aside and let's accept it as God's word, just as Muhammad did, and let's believe it. You see, basically, you want to put them in tension with their own view of God and with their own prophet uh, and say, if Muhammad could say, bring me your books and I will show you the truth therein, then you ought to be able to do that if you follow your prophet, right? Yeah, this is great. Is another question here? Oh, can, can I say one other word, too? If I had to, I think I would, I would also um, begin to try and weaken his confidence in the Quran by saying Prophet Muhammad never wrote a word of the Quran. Uh, the Quran was written down by those followers after Muhammad, many of whom were dying of old age and the wars. And the Quran, as we have it, was assembled by Uthman. Uh, one, one of the caliphs in, in, uh, that followed the prophet. And the rival versions were burned, right? So with the Bible, we have manuscript evidence from multiple places, multiple times, multiple languages that increases our re reliability, our confidence that the Bible we have is the Bible that the first church had. We can't do that with the Quran because so many things were burned and discarded, right? Uh, and that's, that's part of why you have Sunni and Shia is, is over a debate about verses that should have been in the Quran according to Shias that, that wasn't. Yeah? It's good. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your time with us. It's wonderful. I'm finding it uh, personally uplifting. Praise God. Uh, my question is about uh, ethnicity, really. Uh, many Muslims are consider themselves to be mortal blood enemies with the Jews, and yet we worship a Jew. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if ethnic issues come up ever in your uh, discussions with Muslims and how you deal with that, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> usually when it comes up, it's because I've insulted someone. Because they've asked me a question and taken a position that's like the Pharisees, the Jewish Pharisees in the Scripture, rather than the prophet Jesus. And, and I've pointed that out to them. You know, so ooh, we're not like Jews, we're not like Jews. Well, actually, in rejecting the Messiah uh, and taking a legalistic attitude, you're just like Jews. Um, and, and in having a sin nature uh, that, that you need to be saved from, you're just like Jews and like all the rest of us, right? So the way I try and deal with ethnicity, if I have to deal with it, is to try and undermine the idea that there's some kind of Arab privilege it is a privilege that comes from being Arab and Muslim that kind of exempts you from um, the questions of racism, that exempts you from the, the issues of sin and the need of redemption. Um, and, and I just try and put that in a category of, of, of as, as evidence of our fallenness from which we need to be saved, rather than leaving it in the category of historical and political tension and, and strife and so on. So I'm not at all interested in siding with Jewish people 
or siding with modern day Israel. Um, there are places for that conversation to happen, um, just not when I'm trying to get the gospel across, right? That, those are just one of those roadblocks that, that gets in the way. And so um, I, I try to sort of not have that conversation, except to point out the sinful ways in which we have had that conversation, and then point to Christ and our need for redemption there. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, is there another question, comment, concern, Sarah? You need to thank this gentleman for running the microphone for us there. We appreciate that. We've got, we've got to get you your own talk show, man. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you were born Muslim and grew up Muslim, mm. but I never saw Quran. So I definitely don't know what is in Quran. And I have four years in Christianity. So my question is, why if the, uh, uh, the Muhammad is the holy one. Why the Islam is asking people to pray for him? Why, as Christians, Jesus is our interceder? Mm -hmm. That's my first question. The second question, it will be come from the Baptist church, which you are representing. Mm -hmm. I have made a research from the internet, and I have read that the the Baptist Church was, was created in 18th century or 19th century because of fear in trying to escape the massacres, mm, persecution. the persecutions which were on that time. According to you, why Baptist Church is like a, to escape from Christianity to Christianity? Why the yeah. Baptist Church were Great question. A kind of to escape some, some, some persecutions, yep. persecutions. Great question. Great question. Uh, let me take the second question first, uh, since I am a Baptist. Um, Baptists exist because we read the Bible. <laughs> uh, that's a joke for all my Anglican and Presbyterian friends here, yeah, <laughs> Lutheran friends. Um, no, historically, Baptists do get their rise out of the Reformation. Uh, particularly uh, get their rise out of the English Reformation, where there were some folks who had broken away from the Anglican Church because they were reading their Bibles, rediscovering the Scriptures, rediscovering the Gospel, uh, who came to see in the Bible um, what we call believer's baptism, that the only persons who were baptized in the Bible were persons who professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and repentance um, toward faith in Christ. Now, that was radical in that time. Uh, and part of why that was really radical was because in that time, there was no distinction between church and state, right? So, so and, and there, were, there were sort of debates about which was greater, whether or not the king was under the authority of the church or whether or not the church was under the authority of the king. Uh, but in that history, there's a real struggle between church and state. But everybody thought that they were joined together, right? so that there was no idea that you could be a member of the, of the state of the country and not a member of the church. When you were baptized into the church as an infant, you were also, in effect, baptized as a citizen of the state, right? So when Baptists break away from that, and they begin to teach that, no, actually, you can't be baptized until you're a believer, well, that sounds like anarchy. That sounds like overthrowing the government. That, that sounds like overthrowing everything uh, to, a, to a, a system that had been built upon church and state kind of being together, right? And so at the hands of, of many Christians who thought their Baptist brothers were in serious error and at the hands of, of government powers who, who wanted the unity of the church uh, joined together under the state's power, uh, Baptists were treated um, in many cases as heretics. Uh, they were treated as people who were teaching a dangerous idea. Uh, and many left England, went to the New World, uh, and some of the New World colonies in the Americas, like Rhode Island, uh, became a Baptist colony, um, and Baptists began to practice their faith and to flourish in that way. Yeah, it's a great question. Your first question was, why pray for the Prophet Muhammad if the Prophet Muhammad is in fact uh, pure or clean, and so on. And here's a place where I think Muslims are, they contradict themselves in their theology, right? 
So in, in one sense, a Muslim is taught to say a little prayer for Muhammad every time they mention their name, right? So, you know, you, you mention the prophet Muhammad and you hear, peace be upon him, right? Um, here's where Muslims, and I think this is another place where Muslims show us that they don't have a real good understanding of sin. I remember being in, in one debate and uh, we were talking about sin. A young lady asked a question from the audience about Adam and Eve and sin um, and, and asked it of my Muslim opponent, and he was kind of offended. And he says, no, 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 Adam and Eve never sinned. And I, I nearly fell out my chair. I said, like, what? What? <laughs> what? What are we all doing here then? And he went on to explain. He said, basically, he went on to explain and say, the prophets, they may have made some mistakes here or there, but, but they were not sinners, right? Um, and, and he went on to maintain that view. And, and I think that's just an indication of the inconsistency of Islam in understanding how serious sin is uh, and understanding how that sin is removed. Uh, we cannot pray for the prophet Muhammad. He has appeared before the throne of God and he has been judged, right? It's appointed for man to live once and after that, the judgment, right? We have this life to repent and to believe. Right? Not the life to come and not some, some purgatory, some intermediate state. We have this life to repent and to believe. Uh, and our sin is so serious that if we die in our sin, we are eternally separated from God. Right? And that's the point to make really clear to our Muslim friends. Now, the question is, do you do that with the prophet? Well, I think it's going to depend upon how well you know your Muslim friend. Right? So some people are going to be so offended by that that they won't hear the rest of the gospel, right? For that person, I'll save that for a later time. Other persons may, may be able to hear that and accept that and not feel offended to the point where we can't talk any further. And with that person, I would, I would make that plain, that yeah, Prophet Muhammad has gone on to judgment uh, and, and our prayers for them are not effective. Yeah. I, hope that, I hope that helps. Sarah, did you get the mic? Um, so I have a question over here. I hear your voice. Just can't see you. Oh, there we go. Excellent. English guy hiding at the back. English um, guy in the back. It's where we like to keep English guys. <laughs> it's, where we, it's where we belong. Um, my question is, you talked about defending the Trinity. Yes. Um, which passages would you use to show the deity of Christ, Christ's godliness? And would you use any from the Old Testament as well? Great question. Uh, I think what I try to do is stay in places that seem to me to be clearest about that. Um, and I understand that my Muslim friend will, they often will want to allow or disallow certain passages based on what they think is, is authentic. Um, so again, step one, you've got to defend the Bible in its whole. Um, but clearly John 1 is a place to go. Uh, Colossians 2 uh, and, and 1, where, where Paul gives us such a high view uh, of Jesus' divinity. Um, obviously, if you, if you go to the Pauline letters, your Muslim friend is gonna say, oh, that's Paul. Um, he's gonna take a page out of the, the book of liberal Christians and say, Paul made up a different Christianity than what Jesus practiced. So then you wanna go back to the gospels and you wanna find passages where, where Jesus, he doesn't say I'm God, but he demonstrates that he's God. So go to the passages where he forgives sin and Jewish people say, hey, you can't do that, only God can do that. Or go to the passages where he walks on water, where he raises the dead, where he heals the sick, where he demonstrates that he's the Lord over, um, over creation. Or go back to the Sermon on the Mount and see how Jesus um, shows he has authority even over the commands of God, where he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Um, or, or see how he, how he deals with David's psalm, where he asks, well, who, what's going on with David in the psalms when David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. Who's, who's he saying that of? Well, he's saying that of the Messiah. Yeah, and Jesus is saying in so many words, that's who I am. I'm, I'm Lord. Um, and so those are some of the passages that I would, that I would think about there. Um, and that psalm example would be a, a good example of an Old Testament passage spoken of in the New Testament that, that demonstrates his deity. That's good. All right, coming around this way. You mentioned uh, the, the aspect of um, 
the, the sacrifice and the importance of substitution. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a conversation with one Muslim, I detected that they also have um, sacrifice in the religion, but a very uh, different concept mm -hmm. and not a concept of substitution. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain a little bit more about yeah, it? It's a, it's a great question. Um, there is a concept of sacrifice in Islam. Um, and you see it when we end the Feast of Id. Um, and and, and there's, there's korban, there's a sacrifice of, of the goat there, which is in, its, in Islamic tradition points again back to Abraham, right? So it's there, it's just not prominent, right? Uh, it's just not emphasized there. So that's just a place where I think that might be a good place to start uh, as common ground with, with our Muslim friends. But from there, you've got to, you've got to really develop the theme uh, more richly and, and to make it more robust in their understanding. And you won't be able to do that with the Quran. You won't be able to do that in Islam. You'll have to, you have to come back to the scriptures uh, and do that from the scriptures. Uh, but it is there. It's weak. Uh, but it gives us a place of contact, a starting place. Uh, and it takes us back to a passage that we share uh, with Abraham uh, and the sacrifice of his son. Uh, but we, we have to sort of then teach, it's God who supplies the goat. It's God who supplies the sacrifice. Um, and, and then come forward and see that it's God who supplies himself as that sacrifice, as we, as we read the scripture and understand the scripture. Yeah, look at right up front here, the second row, Miss Sarah. I wanted to latch on to that um, point number four about sacrifice because this is where the conversations have gotten stuck a number of times. Um, you uh, talked about the, the fact that it is difficult for them to believe in the sacrifice um, and that uh, we need to ask them to produce more evidence beyond their word. Now when what we're using is our word, how do you get beyond our word versus your word? Yeah. Um, our evidence versus your evidence? Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. Uh, because the tendency to be to play Bible ping pong, right? You know, I hit you my verse and you hit back your verse. Uh, and and that, that just makes everybody tired, right? Um, I, I think what, what we have to do is, this is going all the way back to the first point. We got to establish the authority of the scripture, that, that the Bible is revelation from God that it's our duty as believing people to submit to it and to accept it. And I would make the argument, and, and here's where you're, you're, you're bumping right into the basic claim of Islam. So most Muslims believe something like this, I've heard it put this way, that Judaism is the elementary school, Christianity is the high school, but Islam is the university, right? That Islam is the perfect religion. That it, that it completes the revelations of God and it corrects what went before it, right? Well, that, that we, we could never abide by that. We could never accept that view of history and the progress of religion. Um, and so when we're in that first point, establishing the scriptures, here, here's part of what we have to sort of set ourselves up to say. And that is, the, and, and that is this, that Islam really does not continue Judaism or Christianity. It's not, the same, it's not the same river. It's actually a different stream. It's a different river. Um, and the claims that it makes, the proof of that is the claims that it makes contradicts everything that's gone before it, right? And so what you're trying to get your Muslim friend to do is decide which scripture they're going to believe because they can't, they, they can't believe the Quran and be a consistent Muslim. I had mentioned earlier that there were three things that were sort of a turning point for me in, in my own journey. One was that water cooler conversation about righteousness. The second one was the miscarriage of our first child. The third was reading the Quran. I remember one Ramadan up early for the fast, getting ready to make prayer and reading the Quran and having this awareness strike me that I couldn't be a consistent Muslim and believe the Quran because the Quran was admitting too much on one hand and taking away too much with the other, right? So if, if Muhammad says that the Gospels are from God, how can I now reject the Gospels, right? Um, the Quran would teach in 11 places, would make references, at least 11 places, I think this is right, I might be confusing this with, with Isa, 
our Messiah. In 11 places, it calls Jesus the Messiah. Well, what's the idea there? What is the Messiah? That's a, that's a Jewish concept, right? And, it, and it's developed in, in the Bible. This Messiah literally means anointed one. Well, the next question is, what's he anointed for? Well, he's the chosen one of God to take away the sins of the world. So if I'm going to be a self-consistent Muslim, I can't believe that Jesus is the Messiah and deny that he's the chosen one to take away the sins of the world. You know? um, so in, in being consistent with their own book, they, they wind up in these very bad dilemmas. Several times the, the, the Quran mentions the Holy Spirit. And I ask your Muslim friend, who's the Spirit of God or who's the Holy Spirit? And very often, the traditional answer you'll get is that that's a reference to the angel Gabriel, right? Well, then you read the Quran and you read those passages where the Holy Spirit is mentioned, and you see some passages which mention all of the angels and the Spirit. And I was like, those are two different categories. What is this Holy Spirit of God? Is that not making partners with God? Is that not talking, is that not borrowing from Christian language about the third person in the Trinity? But you don't believe the Trinity. Why is this in your book? You know, and so I think what you want to do is, is create a situation where the Bible is, is, is plausible and where there's a suspended belief about the finality of the Quran long enough where they can consider the Bible honestly. And the way to do that is to sometimes prompt them to think about the Quran honestly and to, and to sort of push toward the contradictions uh, that, that exist if you're trying to be a faithful Muslim and believe what the Quran teaches. The gentleman over here had a question. I, I hate to make you go that far, uh, but you're young and fit. And <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I hope that, I hope that was helpful. Okay. I work in a workplace where there's an increasing number of Muslims in the um, workplace coming from several different directions. Um, the variance goes from Bosnia to Israel to Egypt, Turkey, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, in general, they know that I'm a believer and that um, they're going to have hard time, a hard time with me um, because I have considerable theological background. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm finding out is that I have a real hard time having a one-on-one -on -one talk with anyone because um, the, um, it's really to the point where some of the guys who've been there for quite a while are just engaged by using kind of a friend, friendly fire takia um, thing. They'll, they'll, lie to the other colleagues yeah. about me yeah. so that they won't talk to me because they're afraid. Um, what's the difference between the personal one-on-one um, -on -one thing and doing things like um, having debates and things like that on, on the, mm -hmm. the social, psychological level of, yeah. of conversation. Great question. Great question. First of all, um, praise God that the Lord has brought the nations to our doorsteps. He's, he's made the work of missions that much easier if we would share the gospel, right? And secondly, praise God for your testimony, for your witness that you are known to be uh, a Christian uh, and, and a thoughtful Christian in the workplace. Uh, so part of your witnessing job is done uh, simply by having that to be known, made known in the workplace. So I praise God uh, for that. Uh, so now, you know, I think there are two things to, to, think, to keep in mind. One is, is just to continue to live faithfully a Christian life. So, so if you're being lied about um, on, in the workplace, and yet you're living a life full of integrity, people will then begin to see the difference. You know, you, I, I've been told that this guy is really argumentative and, you know, doesn't know the Bible very well. But actually, every time I see him, he's gentle and kind, um, and he seems to speak of Jesus as if they are on a first name basis, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a way in which your living then becomes, we pray, um, light to them and, and, and tasty, salty to them. Uh, so that's part one.
part two, I think, is this, and this is the case whenever I'm doing the, the public dialogues in, in Dubai or other places or whatever after the dialogues, right? That's when a lot of the conversations start. So we'll, we'll spend three hours debating and we'll spend another two hours just talking to pockets of people who come to us. Um, and I realize that, that when I'm asked a question from the floor or someone comes up to the stage afterwards and asks me a question, there, there are at the stage a dozen other listening ears or in the debate, there are 700 other people in there. I'm answering the question not for the guy who's trying to attack me. I'm answering the question for all the other people watching, right? Uh, and so you, you will have some guys in your workplace who are not good faith conversation partners. Uh, they're not sincere. Uh, they want to twist things and, and paint you a certain way. Um, if, if they were to ask me a question publicly, I'd answer their question, but I would answer their question with the other folks in mind who, who I'm trying to win, who, who I pray are, are more open to the truth uh, than perhaps the guy asking the question. But it's a, it's a, it's a long strategy. It's a long-term strategy uh, of being consistent. Yeah, go ahead, a follow-up. So you have a guy in the workplace who's moving toward becoming an imam who is now sort of gaining some authority among the other people in the workplace and he uses that authority to shut down their questions and the discussion. And so what to do there? I'm reading a little book right now that my wife um, recommended to me. It's called In the Land of Blue Burkas. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful little biographical book of a woman who worked for five years in Afghanistan. Uh, and I love the way she writes the book because she tells her five, the story of her five years in Afghanistan uh, through the, the sort of lens of a lot of personal interactions that she's had with people. And, and she does a really wonderful job of highlighting what you're saying, that there are some settings where she's talking to people and, and really the only person who is speaking in the room is the one who's assumed to have the most Quranic knowledge, the one who's assumed to have the most authority in that way. Uh, and she does a wonderful job of illustrating how to bring forward some theological issues uh, in a way that is respectful, which is very important if you're laboring in Afghanistan, um, and in a way that shows the problems or the contradictions in that position. So you might, it, the next time you have that conversation, whatever is the question that you're asked, you might instead sort of try and figure out a way to, to sort of turn that around um, and to, to sort of put on the table not that question, but how, for example, we understand authority in Islam and Christianity. What is authority for? And you say, hey, you know, Christ, we call him Lord. He says in Matthew chapter 28 that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. You know what the amazing thing is? He doesn't use his authority to silence people. He talks to people. He asks questions. He teaches them the truth about heaven and hell, right? And ultimately, he lays down his authority to die for them. How does authority work in Islam? You, you, you see. <laughs> and, and that's exactly right. And so without, <laughs> that's exactly right. And so what you wanted them to do is to think about, well, how does authority work in Islam? Well, the, the mullah or the, or, the, or the imam tells us what we must think. Well, this, is that how it works in Christianity? Well, no. Or how does it work in Islam? Well, you, you, you crush those who disrespect Islam. Is that how it works in Christianity? No. Christ tells us to turn the other cheek. You know, and so the best you can do there sometimes is sort of point out the inadequacies of Islam by, by sort of finding that issue beneath the surface and making that the issue. And, and hopefully you, you begin to loosen his grip on some people such that they begin to think about what they're hearing. And they will be thinking about what they hear you say in those conversations. Okay. Thank you guys. You guys have been great. I'm uh, getting the time from Matthias and since he's taller than I am and since he's feeding me, I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Thank you could you. do is we have many, many Muslims in Germany. Why don't you pray as we close for our witness that we may be bold and wise and that God may, may use our, our words to win many of them Amen. for the Christian faith. Let's do it. Let's pray together. Father, we do give you thanks that you have made our Muslim neighbors and friends in Germany in your own image. 
We praise you that, O oh Lord, they bear the, the imprint of your glory. And they are made to bring you more glory. And Father, we do mourn and we do grieve at the thought that many of our Muslim neighbors and friends, unless they hear the gospel and believe in you, they are headed, O oh Lord, to an eternity of judgment. It's the same judgment that we deserve because of our sins. It's not because simply that they are Muslims. It's because, O oh Lord, that their sin nature has led them to idolatry, it's led them to reject Christ. And, O oh Lord, we pray unless you overcome that by your spirit, they would be lost. And so we do pray that you would conquer the hearts of our Muslim neighbors and friends. Conquer it with your grace. Conquer it with your love. Conquer it with the truth of your gospel. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would make us faithful and not fearful so that we would tell our friends the truth about how they may be saved and the truth about Jesus. Many of them are coming from lands where they've only heard the name um, in a Muslim context, and they've heard so many distortions and so many false things. They've been brought up with so many traditions, Lord, not only in Islam, but so many false traditions about Christianity. So give us wisdom, Lord, we pray, to be able to speak the truth and to know what things to, to talk about, what things to avoid, and give us the very words to speak so that, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, their eyes might be open, their hearts might be changed, and that we might see a revival among our Muslim neighbors and friends with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them being brought to you in saving faith. Oh Lord, I pray that you would make Germany the place of a second great reformation, that it might be the reformation of the Arab Muslim world or the Indonesian Muslim world or the Pakistani Muslim world by the spread of your gospel and the building of your church among those peoples, wherever they are. Do this, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.